Before we begin, I would like to thank the British Psychological Association, especially Lloyd Beer and my friend Tom Nixon, of course, for inviting me to this annual lecture series. Medieval liturgy is deeply complex, though it may sound like a mere platitude, this fact bears emphasizing in our early 21st century context, in which we prefer to simplify and flatten out complex topics to a disconcerting degree. This trend towards generalization has also had an impact on the study of the Middle Ages. When we talk about the liturgy, above all, the many ways of staging the liturgy, we generalize about common trends across Europe, despite the fact that examining the medieval document so was clearly that nothing was as simple or as straightforward as it might seem to us today. A study of the organization of Western European ecclesiastical space in terms of liturgical action forces us to juggle generalizations that help us understand search solutions and models with a historical complex replete with variety and individuality. A medieval building that we can view and visit today bears no resemblance to the structure as it existed between the 12th and the 13th century, nor with the structure that we saw from the transformation of the 15th and the 16th centuries, nor with the structure that was modified by restorers working in the 19th and 20th centuries. In order to understand the different historical moments and the architectural images of each building, we must understand their functional and liturgical evolution. Today, our churches are the product of the passage of centuries, as well as for the different ways in which the architecture was activated through changes in the liturgical use of space. These liturgical uses took place on a quotidian, day-to-day -day level, overseen by those responsible for modifying the building to meet changing functional needs. While the principal rites and liturgical division of the day and year may be shared in common, in other cases the liturgical model, model is not so clear. Let us try a simple intellectual exercise. If we were to compare how Christmas was celebrated in Toledo and in Mallorca, we should not find many differences. The office, the music, the rite, the sound of the seal. The real change that we see is in the relationship between the religious rite and its staying in architectural space. If we agree that those who design ecclesiastical space generally obey, obey liturgical necessity, we must also underscore that they did so within very general parameters, such as the basic need for the main altar, sacristies and auxiliary spaces, a central nave to accommodate the faithful, as well as processions and private altars. Local particularities help explain the singular architectural features of each building. The Visitatio Sepulchre was a reenactment of the moment when the three Marys find the empty tomb of Christ and speak with the angel who was wearing the, wearing the tomb. It, it was celebrated between the evening of Holy Friday and the morning of Easter Sunday, and it was one of the most complex celebrations to be staged within the church not least because the liturgical action was subdivided into four basic different parts. The arrival of the woman to the tomb, the appearance of the angel, the angelic proclamation of the resurrection, and the woman's departure to spread the news. From the perspective of the celebrants, the action consisted of a dialogue, either spoken or sung, between the three Marys and the angel, who asked the Marys whom they seek and tells them about the resurrection. The staging could take the form of anything from a simple dialogue between two choirs during the entry of, to the matins of Easter Sunday to much more complex celebration, with young men dressed as the three Marys and the angel in distinct parts of the church that were decorated with these scenes. The liturgy sought to commemorate the historical events that took place in Jerusalem and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It is undeniable that much of the Christian liturgy took the two main centers of liturgical production, Rome and Jerusalem, as a major source of inspiration. However, the liturgy of the Holy Sepulchre was, so to speak, one of there and back again. 
I refer to the fact that the liturgy, as it was celebrated in Jerusalem, was imitated across Western Europe, which required the definition and formation of unique spaces and topographies that could be reproduced across geographical and architectural contexts different from those described by travelers, chronicles, and liturgical rubrics that tell us about the Holy City. At the same time, in Holy Sepulchre itself, those same models that had been translated from a Western European context were in turn imposed on the structure during the time of the Crusade. First, in the 11th century, the Anastasis saw within its walls the liturgical uses of the cathedrals of Bayeux, Evre, and Paris, exchanging its former patrons from new communities of regular canons under the other side of a prior. I will not bore you with an account of the earliest texts that mention the celebration of the Visitatio, not recount the words of the Regularis Concordia concerning the Visitatio, nor will I tell you about the first literary manifestation of the Visitatio in the Iberian Peninsula, studied so thoroughly by my colleague at the University of Santiago de Compostela, Professor de la Castro Caridad. My purpose this afternoon is to draw attention to some of the most important manifestations of the Visitatio Sepulchre in Iberian art, and to the inevitable reflection they prompt. In concluding, I will briefly consider the interaction of liturgy, architecture, and images focusing on the Church of San Justo in Segovia and the appearance and use of sculpture in the staging of the liturgy of the Holy Week. The liturgy of Holy Week required the creation of a tomb to house the host of the celebration of the Mass during the liturgy of the Presentificare of the Good Friday. First commemorating to a greater or lesser degree than to the movement of Christ. The celebration varied from, from cathedral to cathedral, monastery to monastery, parish church to parish church. In some, each specific liturgical use across prayer reformation in Europe was conditioned by a surprising variety of liturgical expressions. Differences in the manner of celebrating and staging the rite depended on the necessities of each location. The recreation of the station of the cross each located in specific spaces that evoked the original locations in Jerusalem took place in the liturgies of cathedral, monasteries, and parish churches. Our sources are not just confined to texts from late antiquity, but also include travelers who left their notes on how to define an imaginary topography that could be adapted to specific sites conditioned by their own specific circumstances. Most of the time, what is left to us today are the remains of this paraphernalia, chapels, the dedications, and the images that presided over those spaces. The tomb could have been located in a number of places within the church, always and exist, depending on the local context. Thus, we find it in positions that are sometimes merely temporary and which you could vary from year to year, such as altars or section of the Western Wall, as in Barcelona, and in Genona. Inside chapels, funerary chapels outside the main building, or eastern, eastern sepulchres that open up from some stone some wall of the church, as we see in San Gil de Bejar. In the lower story of a tower, as in the chapel of San Justo de Segovia, or in the structures built especially for Holy Week, best known as the Counter-Reformation Monument, or Monumental, and understood as the heir of, to a long tradition that now known only tangentially and through scanned material remains and textual references in liturgical ordinaries. In any case, the material expression of this ritual was highly varied and included complex installations that constitute a true liturgical theater with recreation of the arch of the tomb, the figure of the Christ crucified, taken down from the cross and buried, and other kinds of images that I will discuss during this chapter. Contrary to what one might think, there is no specific space nor architectural structure in any medieval burial cathedral or monasteries that can be clearly identified as the site of the celebration of the Visitatio. Any chapel or altar could have been used for this purpose. In the 15th century, the ordinary of the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela suggests 
that the Visitatio was typically celebrated at the main altar, which served as the tomb behind which were located a choir of three children that sang the part of the Three Marys. In Zaragoza, the Visitatio was celebrated in a chapel that opened into the aisles, probably the north aisles, of the cathedral. When we lack clarity and consistency in the Iberian Peninsula, in Europe, there did in fact exist a clear trend towards evoking the architecture of the Holy Sepulchre inside the bigger buildings by means of centrally planned architectural structures, like this one, Magdeburg, or not central structure, for example, Winchester, were known to everyone here. But before we take this to be a general phenomenon, we must bear in mind something important. A quick survival of the chapels dedicated to the Holy Sepulchre reveals that not all of these structures reproduce the, holy architect the original architectural plan found in Jerusalem. Nor do all of the centrally planned structures show direct influence from the holy city. <coughs> that is, the architectural structure in Jerusalem could be evoked in a deliberate and conscious manner, even if not all these versions sought to emulate the form of the original, original not even the approximate copies famously studied by Richard Profiler. Moreover, the monumental rotunda was not the only element that was frequently copied. The edicule of the tomb of Christ also achieved a certain statue of its own to be emulated in commemorative architecture. Among its obvious prototypes prototype is the Navarrese Church of Torres del Rio, topped by a lantern that faithfully reproduces the appearance of the chapel where Christ was entombed, almost like a model or maquette of the original. This discretion helps to underscore the fact that in art historical literature, the anastasis has come to serve as a means by which we explain phenomena of medieval European architecture that sometimes look like it or nothing like Jerusalem. It is a fascinating history of locations in which almost any central planned building is overshadowed by the symbolic presence of the Holy Sepulchre and by the complex topographies that, in more than one building, are resolved by understanding them as an interaction between the rotunda of Jerusalem and the nearby Basilica of the Martyrium. It is worth pausing to considering the situation through the lens of a very suggestive example that has been interpreted as a copy of the Holy Sepulchre because of its central plan and general Eastern aesthetic. The chapter house of the old cathedral of Salamanca, located in a cluster. Here's the facade. Like many such structures, Salamanca's chapter house is centrally planned. In this case, the model selected was that of the Islamic Kuba, but without any Islamic meaning. That is to say, we see here the clear transposition of an Islamic architectural model, model into a new Christian functional context, as a southern house. The ribs of the ball have within them a smaller, slightly higher dome, following a pattern well known from the brick and stucco vaults of the Mezquita of Cordoba built during the expansion of al Hakam II. Paris, but there is no reason to see this as a copy of the Holy Sepulchre. Its models lie in the Iberian Peninsula. Focusing on the churches that, that truly did follow the plan of the Holy Sepulchre, the most noteworthy examples in the Iberian Peninsula are the so-called Charola of Tomar and the Veracruz in Segovia. The first, this one, was a Templar foundation, but we do not know if the second belonged to a military order or was a simple Paris church. Of the two, I prefer to focus on the example of the Church of the Veracruz in Segovia, which in the 16th century changed its original dedication from the Holy Sepulchre to the True Cross in order to commemorate the donation of a relic of the True Cross that was enshrined in a magnificent sculptured shrine built into the chapel on the lower story of the tower. Neither the 16th century nor the chapel of dedication concerns us here. Rather, I would like to focus on the fact that this Segovian church is a basic example of unification, dedicated of the Holy Sepulchre 
was not located in the, in the interior of a part of the liturgical furniture, as we see in Santo Stefano in Bologna, or in other sites where similar liturgical furnaces, furnaces were documented. But it was integrated into the structure itself, completing the architectural framework with the annular structure that surrounded it. As at Tomar, Portugal, but here divided into two stories. On the other hand, the Holy Sepulchre of Segovia is one of the few buildings that is a copy of an anastasis built not to house members of the monetary orders. Does it mean that we see here the development of a liturgical celebration distinct from that found in other sites that belong to Knights of the Sepulchre or Knights of, the, of Knights Templar and evoke the architectural form? It would seem not. On the contrary, the liturgy associated with military orders was perfectly suited to the general calendar and the interplay of these uses of their back again that I discussed earlier. There can be no doubt that the Holy Sepulchre in Segovia is an imitation of that in Jerusalem. During Holy Week, the building must have been at its most magnificent staging the document in one of its outbuildings that would have been closed until Eastern Sunday. The problem we encounter is that one of the architecture itself, some imagery and a few textual references, there is no surviving ordinary that tell us what and how performed the liturgy in the Segovia, the Segovia church. Nor do we know if they celebrated a truly theatrical liturgy or if the latter liturgy was limited to music on dialogue between choruses. This latter scenario was probably more common, although it is far from more appealing to imagine an elaborate staging of the conversation between the three Marys and the angel. As I mentioned earlier, the edicule of the Vera Cruz of Segovia is divided into two stories, clearly conceived for the purposes of staging the liturgy. As a customary, the central ronda, rotunda in the Segovian church must have functioned as a stage for a theatrical liturgy celebrated around an image of the recumbent Christ placed in the upper story of the edicule. A staircase on the western side of the edicule provides access to the upper story, and in the upper chamber, a large single window faces, to the, main, faces the main altar. The perimeter is lined with smaller windows whose location in the central ring suggests their function was not to provide illumination. Rather, these smaller windows seem to have function to indicate to the outside that something was taking place inside. I suggest that these architectural and scenographic features serve a paraliturgical function during the celebration of the resurrection, and their design was conditioned by this function. When the three holy women approached the tomb and found it empty, it empty, the windows would illuminate the edicule facing the faithful, and the angel would appear at the large window facing the main altar, displaying the holy shroud, and then told the resurrection secret dixit, Alleluia. It remained to be seen whether or not this was carried out by a man, like a man or an image, and if instead an angel, the image the image of the rising Christ has, has, was placed in the window. In late 14th, 4th century, sorry, the building area described the Vespers it celebrated in the architectural complex of the Holy Sepulchre as the Lucernae. According to the, her description, as twilight fell, the faithful met at the Anastasis, and all of the lamps were lit, brilliant illuminating the interior. In her words, now the light is, now, is not introduced from without, but it's brought forth from within the cave, that it's from within the rage, where a lamp is always burning day and night, and the Vesper psalms and antiphonies are said, lasting for a considerable time. This sounds like the same staging, the same metaphor of the sepulchre that emits light that we see reproduced in Segovia certainly one of the most beautiful evocations of the Holy Sepulchre in all medieval Iberia. This leads us to another line of inquiry. 
preserved in the nearby parish of San Romana, only 4 kilometers from Segovia, is an image of the recommended Christ, a 14th century image, traditionally thought to proceed from the Church of the Lega Cruz. In order to focus on the role of images in the Visita Sepulchre, we must leave the Church of the Vera Cruz. Some time ago, I wrote about the important complex preserved at the Segovian Paris Church of San Justo, there it is, where there is a clear evidence from the 12th and 13th centuries that demonstrates the liturgical interaction among architecture, imagers, and monumental sculpture. Like in the Church of the Vera Cruz, there are no documentary references to this interaction, but I would like to insist on what has finally become a commonplace among those who research the liturgy, the lack of textual sources in and of, it and of itself is not enough to conclude that there was no complex theatrical liturgical celebration. As I have discussed, in San Justo we have material remains of such, but of just such a liturgy. The sculpture known as the Christ of the, Christ of the Gascons, a late 12th century figure with articulated soldiers and elbows, indicating its use in the rites commemorating the descent from the cross and the document. Second, San Justo also preserves one of the very few interior timpani in the Iberian Peninsula. This historic doorway provides access to a secondary structure. The fact that a sculptured tympanum with figures and a clear narrative was placed atop a doorway underscores the importance of this transitional space. And in San Justo, this doorway led to the lower story of the church bell tower, also understood and used as a liturgical space. In my study of San Justo, I suggested that this space, the chapel, must have been dedicated to the Holy Sepulchre as indicated by the iconography of the tympanum above the doorway. The tympanum depicts an altar prepared with a cloth, on top of which is a cross, the whole ensemble covered by a ciborium and censored by an angel. Three women, the first of whom wears a crown, walk towards the angel, each bearing a own vessel in her hands. On the far left of the composition, a bishop watches over the whole scene from his fourth stool. Some scholars have identified the narrative as the visit of the three Marys to the tomb of Christ, linking the imagery to the liturgy and the figure of the bishop to a historical bishop of Segovia who watches over the celebration of the liturgical drama of the visit to Sepulchre in his own church. If we follow this hypothesis, this Segovian tympanum would take on a meaning distinct from that granted to it up to now. Let's do a brief historical overview. Since Emil Mal made a few suggestions in this regard, scholars have debated the influence of liturgical drama on the development of specific iconographic scenes. It may seem clear that in any unitary but complex culture like medieval Christianity, no artistic medium can avoid the influence of the media, as we see in the relationship between theatrical celebration and narrative cycles. It is, however, one thing to find elements from sacred history that recall the liturgy, such as the apostles bearing liturgical furnishings in Tuscan images of the entry into Jerusalem, as is studied by Dorothy Glass. And quite another, quite another thing, to claim that such representations literally depict liturgical drama itself. Such is the case of the Timbalum of San Justo, with its protagonist, the Three Marys, the Angel, and the Bishop of Segovia contemplating the scene from his fault stool. If this were the case, this would make San Justo unique in the history of all Romanesque sculpture, iconography, and theatre, of course. It would seem too early and too exceptional to be interpreted in such a way. Other scholars have argued that the tympanum depicts the invention of the true cross by Elena. This interpretation finds support in the fact that the first of the three women wears an emperor's crown, 
when the tomb appears like an altar crowned by a cross, accompanied by a bishop who might represent Macarius, the bishop of Jerusalem, who participated in the process of finding the remains of the Dignum Crucis with a letter. I would like to nuance this interpretation by proposing a third hypothesis. I'd suggest that the Timbalum's iconography merges the three Marys before the tomb of Christ and the discovery of the true cross by offering an image of the consecration of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem by Elena, together with Macarius, as a sort of colophon to the story of the discovery of the true cross. In order to represent this, your sculpture borrowed elements from other well-established iconography such as the visit of the three Marys to the empty tomb of Christ. What I would like to emphasize is not that the tympanum of San Justo does not depict the three Marys, but that it does not only depict the three Marys, something I find much more interesting in terms of the overall origins and development of medieval iconography. San Justo is a clear case of iconography, iconographic contamination in which well-known forms and methods of representation were adapted in order to create new and distinct imagery. This phenomenon is well known to students of a, to students of a geography, where it is common to find episodes, usually the most popular, adapted from one sense life to use to depict another sense life, from St. Bernard's to Santo Domingo <coughs> Guzman, from St. Dominic of Guzman to San Vicente Ferrer. In this case of images, Segovia was part of a Castilian region in which this phenomenon was encountered frequently. Not far from San Justo, in the church of San Miguel, the narration of the life of the titular saint took as its iconographic source the Annunciation and the Annunciation to the Sefer, both in the Timbalum and in the paintings in the interior as Fernando Gutierrez Baños has demonstrated. All this is to say that the iconographic adaptation of images was a common practice in central Castile around 1200. But we still need further explanation of the crown worn by the first woman, the altar, and the presence of the bishop. Three elements of the composition that have prompted the most debate. To my mind, there can be no doubt that the explanation of this imagery can be found in the story of the discovery of the true cross by Elena and the cult that developed around her across Europe. Let me add to the discussion another literary source that also insists on the connection between the three Marys and Elena, and which likely inspired, why not, the Segovian Timbalum. A beautiful passage from Odegons of Cluny's Servo de Santa Crucis compares Mary Magdalene, Hecatrix, Elena, Imperatrix, and Mary, Genetrix. Devotion to the Dignum Crucis was particularly intense among the highest echelons of medieval civil and ecclesiastical aristocracy, with deep, tooled, with deep roots sorry, in the very devotional tradition. In Spanish passionary, maybe one of the most important Latin sources on the geography of high medieval Spain, there is a long cycle dedicated to Elena's invention of the true cross, and the most discordant elements of the Timbalum of San Justo can be explained with reference to this text. The altar is that of the Holy Sepulchre, the crown is that of the Empress Elena, and the bishop is that of Jerusalem. This interpretation offers a particularly suggestive model for the process of creating imagery, the basis of what we know as iconographic contamination, the creation of new imagery by adapting existing models, sufficient to change their semantic content. In this case, we see the transformation of the visit of the Holy Woman to the Sepulchre of Christ into the imagery of Elena with her attendance at the consecration of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem in the presence of Bishop Macarius, who accompanied the Empress in her search of the true cross. Having said of this, there is still something that has not been taken into account when it comes to interpreting the iconographic sources 
for the team value of some costo. I'm referring to a group of coins made in Jerusalem that depict on one face a bishop seated on his cathedra and holding his staff, and on the other face the three Marys of the tomb who speak with an angel who senses the tomb that has been recently studied and published by Professor Iris Shagrir from the Open University of Israel. As we see at Samian, we have seen at Samian, scenes from the lives of the saints were taken up and adapted to create a new historical cycle. At Sacusto, this coinage from Jerusalem could have acted as an iconographic point of reference to the representation of a strange new scene, like that of the Empress Elena with the Sermon Carriers, so well attested to the two in the literary traditions of the Iberian Peninsula. What better than an actual artifact from the Holy Land to illustrate this tale from the Holy Land? We have not preserved any of these coins in Segovia, but we know the close relationships between Iberian seas and the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. Once we understand the imagery of the Timbalum, we are still left with the mystery of the articulated sculpture known as the Christ of the Gascons. Christ of the South Frenchmen. Returning to the theme of liturgical celebration, the body of Christ symbolized by the consecrated host, a cross or a recumbent figure, was placed in a sepulchre. Surviving vessels include conical pixides and small charistic caskets in which the host was placed. Sometimes the ceremony of the entombment was much more elaborate. Images of the crucifixion were taken down from the cross, accompanied by the consecrated host that was enclosed in a small Eucharistic casket, or sometimes even in a small cavity within the sculpture itself, which was wrapped in a shroud that itself came to be seen as a sort of relic, as has been proposed for the Holy Shroud of Torino. Here you can see the uh, wound between the ribs of the Christ of the Gascons in the place where they, they say, the, the holy host during this process, of this liturgical process for the liturgy of the press certificate. Particularly in the case of articulated images, we run, we run into many problems when we try to establish when they were used. While we have good, a good catalogue of articulated figures, figures of Christ from Spain and Portugal, none of these figures date as far back as the Middle Ages. In fact, it appears that the Segovian Christ of the Gascons was modified at a later time, at a later date, probably the 16th century, transforming a simple sculpture of a crucified Christ into an articulated body. Surviving in various sources, that count the theatrical rite of the descent of the, from the cross date no earlier than the 15th century. And the use of such articulated figures was not widespread until the 17th and 18th centuries. As we see in the Cathedral of Mallorca, there's a very interesting legal process in the Cathedral of Mallorca where it was represented the whole uh, way of staging the descent of the cross, and a painting of a sermon conserved at Medina del Campo, where we can see the descent of the cross in presence of the Virgin, while a preacher man is in the pulpit speaking his, or speaking his, his sermon. Alas, our own imagination as historians has led us to see these Baroque sculptures as medieval when during that time the staging of the liturgy was confined to costumes and the exchange of songs in front of images that played the role of actors. The complex ensembles of images of the descent from the cross are a clear indication of this. There were no actors, only singers in front of a theatre of figures. It was not necessary to dress up or act 
without the problems of staging that this group posed. The sculpture replaced the actor and the performance through unveiling and another such tricks of a stagecraft. Place it atop an altar on the corresponding feast day and stage it in a variety of ways, images like the Christ of the Gascons would have been revealed from beneath clothes and linens to amaze and astonish the clergy and the faithful, appearing amidst songs, incense, the tearing of cloth, the throwing of flowers and oblations, the echoing of brass plates, the plaintiff, the lighting of lamps, etc. What about during the rest of the year? What was done with these of sculptured ensembles whose members were often close to life size? Quite simply, they were tied away. The recumbent and articulated figures of Christ returned to their arms in chapel, as did the images of the dead virgin that used to be displayed and continue to be displayed in Mallorcan churches during August and the ceremonies related to the Assumption. As was the case with clothes, embroideries, tapestries, tapestries, candelabra, and other pieces of liturgical furnishing, this sculpture were removed and installed as needed, determined by the liturgical year. The ecclesiastical spaces where celebration took place were dynamic in function, that is, it was necessary to create an appropriate frame for evoking the space where the events were set by changing the appearance of the building and its surroundings through a variety of staging techniques. There can be no doubt that all of the images displayed were created for the purposes of the liturgy. To support it and be an integral part of its celebration, but we often cannot, often cannot access our past and evaluate these works appropriately. Our own cultural baggage betrays us when we think that the celebration of the liturgy during the Middle Ages must have been restrained, accommodating, and similar to our post-reformation and post-Vatican II reality. A ceremony in which sculptures and images sat on altars and played an important role as the rubrics of our liturgical sources suggest seems strange a peculiarity of our remote past. Indeed, they seem so far removed that we have been led to think that these images, today removed from their original settings and appearing in devotional and museum context, might have one served sort of function even more strange and elaborate even than the tableau vivant evoked by an man in his discussion on late medieval sculpture and symbol of the dominant. It is clear that the Easter sepulchres, the chapels built inside the churches, or as independent structures alongside them, had a specific liturgical function during Easter time. But what took place inside this structure that were designed for a single function during a single week of the liturgical year, like in the La Cruz of Segovia? How was the mass officiated? How was the host elevated and made visible within a centrally planned structure or one whose space was broken up by a manicure, surrounded by an ambulatory that sometimes even lacked a clear orientation or location for the main altar and the officiant? Attempts to resolve this problem through architecture are clear. In most cases, an apse or aids were built, facilitating the ordinary liturgical, liturgical use of the spaces that have only a single function during Holy Week. Thank you very much.